very good to interview i think it's very going on very well thank you i think i'm answering something what do you think Rohan welcome to this episode of the New Space India podcast thank you so much for uh, taking some time out to speaking to me thank you for having me np um, so you are uh, one of the youngest entrepreneurs that i know here in india uh, i think uh, you know you were already thinking about making and forming your own company when you are already studying your undergraduate education and you know already had a very clear road map as to what you want to build as a product uh, so tell us a little bit about you know how come these ideas were formed so early in your life and uh, why you chose propulsion as an area yeah um again thanks for having me on your podcast uh space has always been fascinating since childhood um being uh, growing up in uti closer to skies you know and uh, being a fan of science fiction so space has always been a part of me since childhood but uh, Uh, always wanted to uh, d- become a pilot uh, since childhood so uh, chose a domain which is closer to that so in order to understand planes it is better to study how planes are designed so that made me um, choose aeronautics as a career but um, uh, coming into entrepreneurship was not by choice it's something it happened by accident um uh we wanted to the idea was to get into an ivy league school and to uh, continue work on advanced propulsion because uh, if you want to go farther and farther into space you need more efficient form of propulsion and chemical propulsion has exhausted its uh, it has reached its uh, technological limits per se so electric propulsion being the natural choice and uh, sadly in india there is um, um nobody working on it which i can confidently say i mean isro started late so uh, that was the idea um, so uh, in college we had an idea to develop a, a propulsion system which is efficient uses water as fuel why water because it's available on moon and mars so return trips are economical makes sense so we conceived the idea of actually doing this in college but by the time it got completed even our uh, focus on um, you know going into an ivy league shifted to entrepreneurship because we found it entertaining we found it interesting because you have your own platform to do what you like and um, uh, we thought we could grow in it and since uh, attach a business angle to it so that you can fund ideas further so that you continue to do and uh, it has been a great journey since then so uh, started when i was 19 So how did you gather support either in your university or you know among your friends who were you know initially doing things So it was a very difficult time uh, to be very honest nothing was easy the subject itself was very difficult to master because it is not thought it is something um, uh, in a very advanced level and uh, to do something in space you know very well you require a lot of funds uh, and uh, access to grants in India is also very limited and being an undergrad uh, it's even more difficult to get a grant from government and if at all it's accepted you know by the time it comes you are already graduated so we wanted to tackle this problem in a different way um, i studied in coimbatore undergrad and uh, you know there are a lot of um, uh, wealthy individuals in and around coimbatore so i wa- i started talking to them and if they could fund the project so this led me to uh, meeting many industrialists and subsequently uh, from jsw steels mr sajjan jindal uh, through their uh, csr initiative i was able to secure funds something which we did right is before we wanted to do something we figured out we need the money where to get the money and uh, spent more than a year looking for around 20 lakh rupees so uh, that's how uh, we uh, first got funds and then you know started building things so why did uh, you know the jindal family for example trust in your idea and how come you know you were able to convince them to give you not just you know some amount of money but really substantial amount of money because 20 lakhs for a undergraduate student is already yeah and also it's a quite a substantial amount of money uh 
I have uh, gratitude towards them. But uh, why they believed is because uh, I uh, have a habit of writing papers and uh, attending conferences. I used to do that, not now. And uh, fortunately, I was accepted uh, for um, a conference in NASA Goddard um, when I was in my third semester. And um, uh, from Coimbatore, the Rotary Club had sponsored the trip, and it was around all these local newspapers. So the idea was to use water as um, uh, a source of uh, propellant for interstellar missions. And uh, once I came back, uh, Dr. Kalam, uh, who was in city, uh, wanted to meet me. And uh, he gave a letter of recommendation stating that the idea has some potential which needs to be proved. So uh, the letter from him actually convinced them. That's, uh, that's really already very you know, entrepreneurial in getting all of that uh, into place. Um, so did you have, a, because normally you know, space is done by teams, not individuals can't normally do things in space so, so very well. Um, so given that you were already quite young and you, know, you might not have students who are so focused or so you know, sustained in interest in one area along with you, um, so how did you find other people to collaborate with you or you know, how did you motivate them or did they already have motivation to work with you? Uh, it's a good question. So in college I had a small uh, fan following from uh, uh, juniors and uh, uh, two of them became my co-founders initially. And uh, so uh, see everybody were interested in the beginning but these two people stuck uh, with me so I think um, um, and one of my family friend from Mysore, four of us worked together on this. And uh, that's what it's, it, it is never possible uh, individually. And you know, propulsion, it's very deep math to begin with. And something which is not thought to master the subject requires extraordinary mathematical capabilities. And um, I think we four of us uh, divided ta each task. And Bellatrix is all about teamwork. So that also, uh, you know, it was also a learning curve, how to uh, work with a team. And that has led uh, to what we are today, 25 people strong. And that team spirit is still active. So when you raise this amount of money and, you know, it's still at a level of just uh, doing something as a you know, university project. Uh, so when did you think that this is beyond a university project and this is actually a company? So as I told you before, I wanted to do this project to have a couple of patents granted so that um, your admission process to a good university becomes easier. So uh, I saw my peers or my seniors having publications or a good GRE score to attend. Of course, I had a good GRE score. But instead of publications, I wanted to do something more significant, patenting. But by then, also uh, looking at uh, uh, how the e uh, industry ecosystem is changing, where there is demand, and what is that we can do, and also understanding space is not one subject. Uh, and uh, it's every department which is coming together. So we felt we have a space here in space to contribute to and you know the cost of launching satellites and the payload mass fraction of every satellite is so tiny majority is just propulsion once you get into orbit it doesn't make sense how do you reduce the cost okay so looking at those aspect my uh, co-founder especially ashes so we figured out that there is business potential in what we do and uh, uh, we started working on electric propulsion uh, full time uh, back then and uh, taking inspiration from especially uh, Dhruva Space, you also uh, thought that India, it's a right time in India to do something. So we figured out, is India a right place? Of course, U US, it's happening. So, but people like you also encouraged us that yes, it is a right time to do it. And uh, that's how we said, but we told to ourselves, we are still young. If it works, it works. If not, we can always go pursue higher education. But um, the force has been kind. We have, we have been able to do it. Yeah, that's uh, actually a fantastic journey for quite a long time because I think uh, it's been already about eight years or eight, uh, in, into this. Um, so you, you, you formed the company after you graduate and... Yes, uh, 2014 I graduated, 2015 uh, Bellatrix was officially incorporated. Yeah, so 2015 to now is almost you know five years time in that sense. Uh, so just give us a very brief on what happened in the five years. You know, what you, did you do in 2015 and, and you know, later on? 
So uh, we were very fortunate to have ISRO as our first customer. So once we were able to prove that uh, the system works on water as propellant and we were able to ionize it, uh, ISRO came forward and um, uh, gave us uh, the first uh, developmental order to supply them two thrusters, uh, which uh, made others believe in us uh, as not kids, but they have something substantial. Uh, that was the first uh, thing to do. And, dear, and slowly we also realized uh, if you want to cater to the propulsion market in space, one technology can't solve uh, all the needs of a satellite. So instead of diversifying later, we diversified in 2015 and we started working on four different technologies, both in chemical as well as electric propulsion. So it took time, but I think it's worth it. And now uh, we have realized uh, propulsion from nano satellites ranging from micro-newton level to all the way to newton level, all the way up to 5 ton class of satellites. And uh, we have set up a world-class facility. IAAC has been of great help to us. We are incubated there. And a uh, team from four became uh, 25 now. So that has been the journey. And we have also been successful in uh, uh, capitalizing uh, and uh, raising investment um, from a couple of investors uh, to accelerate our growth. And this year is very critical for us. Uh, by December, we are uh, expecting a uh, few of our thrusters to go to space first, get, it, get them space qualified. So that has been the journey. And uh, focusing mainly on propulsion R&D. So you talked about, let's unpack what you talked a little bit. So you talked about the development contract. Uh, so you are probably the youngest company that I know which got a development contract uh, by ISRO directly. Now, how did that happen? Who, who did you have to convince and what was the process? Uh, well, as student, we uh, were visiting ISRO and interacting with uh, people in ISRO. Um, but electric propulsion being what it is, uh, uh, because of lack of expertise, they were also not able to completely put their belief in us. And that time, we had not yet realized it. Uh, the product as students. But once it was done, uh, what happened was um, we then wanted to approach ISRO again, that now it's done, there's something for you to see. Uh, so um, uh, my co-founder, Yashas, in his college in Mysore, uh, the former chairman of ISRO, Shri Kiran Kumar, sir, was uh, the chief guest of a convocation ceremony. So he went and met him and gave uh, two papers which had some results of our testing. So he was inspired and he said, this is what I was looking for. So then he just goes back. After two months, we hear from his office. And he had formed a committee with uh, Dr. P.S. Goel as um, the head of the committee to evaluate it. So we uh, then took the thruster directly to the committee and gave them a live demo in front of their table. And they were convinced then. So, and, but there was no mechanism to kind of uh, support us. So, uh, because I you know as an industry, you have to have performance bank guarantee, security deposit. But they worked a way around and gave a developmental contract, waiving all these things. So it's kind of first time a spin-in had happened. And uh, that was the start of the journey. So I think what I would say is uh, uh, ISRO is very open to collaborative projects. If they see somewhere we can add value to their projects, that's what we felt. And um, that's how we got in. And it's been a good journey so far. So you have this development uh, whatever model, the initial prototype that you have. And of course, to build a fully functional mass production unit, you need a lot more money and you need to prove your space heritage and everything else. Uh, so for this, you of course need you know capital. Uh, so what was your uh, timeline to raise venture capital and convince uh, you know people who have uh, venture capital or risk capital to invest in a company like you? Uh, it's a good question. As you know, in India, the risk appetite uh, for every investor is um, a very low when compared to West. Uh, so it took us a lot of time um, talking to investors and convincing them that there is potential here. But you know space is a $400 billion market, diversified of course, and expected to grow. There is a, a, a growth pattern which is predictable. And uh, you know uh, how the government in the US is opening up to the private space industry and uh, all these indicators. But in order to convince um, investors in India, it took us a lot of time. And to say the business, it was also a learning curve for us. Uh, so we met more than 100 investors uh, before we had our first round. So it was also meeting them and also trying to educate them, is what I would say, and um, uh, convincing them that to have put trust in us. And do. So it was kind of a two-way two exercise. One, educating them and also getting their trust back. 
So it took time. So we planned investment initially in 2015 itself. So we had a plan to go to space by 2018, but we are delayed. Uh, the reason is it took time for us to raise capital to space qualify these things. I think now we are on that track. So what was the timeline like? Because you talked about you know three years initially planned. How long did it uh, take you to convince investors and you know? So it took three years just to convince them and to find the right investors who can support us. I think it was it's worth the wait. Now we have. Uh, a uh, good couple of investors were supporting. In all, how many investors did you have to speak to to then you know, choose an investor at the end? To be very precise, more than 97 people we have met. Uh. Uh, so, of course, you, know, you have uh, raised uh, a bunch of money now and you hired all these people and you're trying to build all of this. Um, let's uh, you know, look at the technology itself. Um, you said, for example, ISRO still uses you know, traditional thrusters and so on. What was the reason that they never uh, invested into electric propulsion before? Uh, because Was it because just that they have a heritage of flying old thrusters that work, or were they not really, have, they didn't have the bandwidth to enter this new area? Uh, 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 the way I would like to answer this question is, you know, uh, ISRO has a philosophy of uh, stick with what works. You know, space, uh, you invest so much money, and if something happens, why take the risk? And uh, being a government um, uh, agency, efficiency is not always a concern until you meet national demand. But uh, the private ecosystem, which is coming where you're trying to cut down costs, so that's when even the electric propulsion existed in 19, since the 1970s. It didn't enter the mainstream. Uh, being, uh, it was all government controlled. Now private people want to, it's like uh, Moore's law, right? Efficiency uh, doubles uh, soon. So that's why it started picking up momentum. And then of course ISRO did invest. They also have a big program and we are collaborating. So give us a very brief overview of, uh, you know, different uh, options in propulsion that are available for satellites and the kind of uh, differences between them and what are the advantages and disadvantages. So uh, electric propulsion is an ocean, but um, uh, uh, we have to look at it two ways. Uh, satellites require propulsion for two purposes. One is their station keeping, that is to keep them stable from the cosmic disturbances. And another one is for orbit raising. Okay, so satellites which are at low Earth orbit do not require orbit raising. They require only propulsion to keep them in a stable orbit. So the sta satellites which are at the geostationary orbit, they require uh, propulsion to do orbit raising because uh, uh, the purpose of a rocket is not to put a satellite in orbit. It's only to impart sufficient velocity to orbit around the Earth. But orbit raising, you need your own propulsion. So chemical is very dominant here. In chemical, there is a bipropellant, monopropellant, uh, in electric, there is electrothermal, electrostatic, electromagnetic, three different verticals under which there are hundreds of technologies which you can work on. The most prominent being Hall effect thruster, because uh, what is the specific impulse or the change in velocity you can get for a unit of uh, propellant fuel consumed? So electric, it is high. And uh, it's also thrust to power ratio is a very critical term because satellites, even though electronics we have uh, miniaturized to a certain extent, but still the solar panels only are so much efficient, right? So you need a larger solar power to ge panel to generate more power. So uh, for every size of a satellite, you have to look at uh, what, uh, what is the power it can generate. So you have to choose the correct electric propulsion system, which has a better thrust to power ratio. So if you look at nano satellites, which can generate few watts, but you still don't have space for more fuel. Something like field emission electric propulsion, FEEP as they call, is an attractive option. For medium-sized satellites like around 150 to one ton, which can generate a power of few hundred watts, Hall effect thruster is a good option. So anything higher, Hall is also a good candidate, but now uh, something like Vasimir, people are working on high thrust electric propulsion devices. And also for station keeping, if you want to work at too low Earth orbit, Monopropellant chemical, where you don't require much um, uh, uh, delta V change in velocity, chemical is always there. So I don't believe future will be all electric. I believe it will be hybrid. There will be a mix of electric and chemical usage. Yeah, of course, the other, I guess, major advantage with electric is that um, it's non-toxic. It's non-toxic. It doesn't uh, occupy more space. You save on launch costs. 
and uh, it's very efficient and it has a longer life. So uh, now that uh, you know, number of satellites which are going up is increasing tremendously. So it's becoming real estate. Orbital slots are real estate in space. So at the end of life, it is also required for you to either uh, move it into a graveyard orbit or deorbit it. Okay. So you require high specific impulse propulsion systems which can do both. So electric naturally wins. So the one when you started, I would say you. When you started, I guess the small satellite revolution was not as big as what it is today. So I guess initially you were thinking mostly about the geostationary satellites and now you're looking at the more the small satellites. True. So when we started Bellatrix, with the, we only looked at the larger sta satellites with ISRO, DRDO as customers and then global big players. But uh, we took a right decision at the right time and diversified. I also think that uh, you had a, a plan for initially to do full propulsion as in also to do engines and then potentially do launch vehicles and so on, right? So why did you drop the idea uh, of you know doing a full launch vehicle with engines and everything? Correct. So uh, we have, uh, we still are working on developing uh, liquid propulsion rocket, in, uh, pro liquid propulsion for rockets basically cryogenic. We have the capability, but uh, it, uh, the decision was taken, uh, uh, the Chetak, as we named the launch vehicle, to place around 300 kilograms to low Earth orbit, uh, at the, uh, presently on hold because of capital uh, constraints. You know, it's very difficult uh, to raise such money. And once you already have a product which you have done in, in space propulsion, you wanted to continue with it. And uh, maybe in future we, we will look into it, but we feel for us uh, the appetite as of now, is not there to enter into the launch vehicle market. And there are other players coming. So we'd like to wait and watch. So there are about uh, you know, two dozen in-space electric uh, propulsion companies that are up and coming all over the world. Um, a lot of them from US, a lot of them from Europe, a bunch of them from China and you know, Japan and places like that. Um, what do you think will be the advantage that Bellatrix will have against uh, these companies? So we are happy to say that uh, we are the only company um, um, in these uh, set of smaller companies which you have mentioned, uh, which has capability to do propulsion from uh, a nano satellite to all the way up to a, a seven ton class satellite. And with complete facilities to develop, test and qualify them. Will there be also a significant cost competitiveness or do you think, you know, because you know, given the Indian setup there will be because the way we have structured Bellatrix uh, from the beginning is to be very efficient and cost effective. So of course there is a lot of cost advantage working with us. So we have seen uh, you know all these uh, emergence of different uh, technology bases uh, because as you said you know there is you know FEEP and there is uh, so many other uh, cold gas thrusters for nano satellites and so many of them. Um, ultimately where do you see propulsion options being chosen because also the class of satellites are different because if there is a 3 kg or a 5 kg satellite against a 100 or a 200 kilo satellite, the kind of options for power and you know accommodation of mass and fuel and everything is different. So how do you see these different classes of satellites using different classes of thrusters? I said it uh, depends on the requirement, uh, what a designer, what an operator basically wants, which altitude, what is the lifetime he's looking at, is he looking to deorbit it, uh, and uh, what is the total delta V requirement, uh, does he plan to do inclination change. So all this, uh, if uh, based on what requirement he gives, we can suggest what is the best propulsion to use. Uh, so that's how we decided and uh, uh, you know structured the company on uh, those uh, aspects. Of course, uh, bigger satellites, if you want to do orbit raising, electric is the way to go. But for smaller satellites, just for station keeping, you have multiple options. If you say, I have only small delta V requirement, cold gas is sufficient. So as I see it, uh, there are three, four major services uh, in space that a propulsion system provides as of today. So one is, of course, if a rocket is putting something in orbit, you can either raise the orbit or correct the orbit. Um, you can deorbit after the lifetime or close to the end of the lifetime of the satellite or you can uh, move away from space debris or move away from other objects so that you can your satellite can survive or if you're working in a very low orbit and you are under the threat of just getting absorbed by the earth atmosphere you can raise orbit to then you know be functional am i missing anything other than that 
one, uh, one more interesting thing which is coming up is uh, sp uh, space tugs, yeah. uh, a much more efficient delivery platform. As you know, uh, uh, to something get off from the earth, you need more power. Electric can't do that. Chemicals, chemical propulsion can only do. But once a rocket puts you in orbit, it doesn't have the capability to put you into multiple inclinations, multiple different orbits. Even though it can do, but you need a bigger rocket to do the job. So where you have an upper stage, an electric upper stage, where all your smaller satellites are put. So it can go because of its higher specific impulse and higher delta V. It can uh, go to multiple inclinations, multiple orbits, and deploy satellites there. And uh, this is one uh, area where uh, electric is there. And also uh, modules which would like to you know, do space servicing, in-orbit servicing. This is one area. And now, uh, since Moon is opening up in a big way, let me not go to Mars. Moon makes more commercial sense now. To have efficient uh, transportation, um, cost-effective transportation to either bring back raw material or anything. So that is also opening up where electric naturally is a good option. So there's been a lot of talk about water as a you know, propellant uh, option and everything. Why is this uh, such a very, you know, big thing that water can be here. See, water is not the best propellant, I would say, and uh, we don't combust, like, sp uh, split hydrogen and oxygen and then, you know, combust, so th that becomes chemical. So what we do is we ionize it to uh, a plasma state and then accelerate it. Uh, but it's a trade-off between the best propellant and the worst, so it doesn't give the best performance. But the thing is, moon there is water available see uh, electric prop uh, propulsion we use xenon as primarily fuel it's a rare earth uh, gas heavy particle so when you accelerate it at higher velocities because of higher density it gives you higher thrust but the problem is if you want space grade xenon it costs you around 13 lakh rupees per kilogram just per kilogram of it okay pretty expensive water on the other hand you know how uh, cheap it is and in space, it's easy for you to maintain water in its liquid state. You don't need pressurization. The entire propulsion system architecture is simplified. On the other hand, there is water available on the moon. So you need not carry your return propellant from moon. So you can maximize the payload or the cargo delivery. So that's why people see in situ resource utilization. That's why people see water as the next big thing. So we kind of figured it out long back. And, but it was a nightmare to make it work, but something which we have done. So we were talking about you know water and uh, using it for in situ and bringing back stuff. Are is electric propulsion a good option to go beyond Earth and Moon? And because you know there are limitations to how how much you can use uh, any propulsion technology to. Uh, you know what would be a good propulsion option for let's say Mars base or. Uh, uh, it depends on uh, what is the amount of cargo you're carrying. Um, if it is. Uh, uh, human exploration, I, uh, I would suggest uh, to Mars, electric would work, like uh, there are different technologies to work with, like Vasimir is a good thing. See, you need something, th uh, there's nothing which exists which gives you limitless specific impulse, right? So in space to move, you have to expel mass. And which engine can do it more efficiently can go much further, okay? So it all depends on uh, what is the payload you're carrying and what's its mass. If it's um, human transportation for up to Mars, I say high power electric propulsion, which is in development. Uh, happy to say we are also capable of doing it, is possible. If you want to travel farther than Mars, okay, now Saturn's moon, Titan is opening up, asteroid mining, all these things, you need to look into nuclear propulsion. So which gives you higher thrust for uh, fuel consume. And it is something doable because uh, NASA and their NERVA program did it way back in the 60s. Okay? So nuclear propulsion and nuclear electric. So that's a good option because, you see, if the farther you go, the solar irradiance factor, what we call, so how much uh, watt per meter square, how much it can generate, decreases. So it's around 1,000 watt per meter square on Earth orbit. Above Earth, Mars, it is half of it, 530 something. It keeps on decreasing the farther you go. So if you can't have fully nuclear powered propulsion, you can have nuclear electric, where nuclear to provide you electricity and that electricity to power your electric thrusters. And that is the way uh, to uh, you know, explore the solar system. But if you're talking about a farther than solar system, we are not there yet. In uh, the process of building up your team, uh, you, know, you and your co-founders, and you're quite a young team, 
uh, you also need kind of experienced people to to bridge the gap and also have expertise come in and uh, so that you have a consolidated team that can deliver the end product um, was it easy to find the kind of people you wanted where were the people you know having the background in and how easy was it to get See, them on board? Uh, it's a very good question you asked because um, uh, of course uh, when we started out, I happily admit everywhere that we were very immature. You know, just like a bunch of boys doing, want to do rockets to space. We, but uh, one good thing which we had in trait in ourselves is the perseverance to stay and do and deliver because we love space. But we were also very clear, we need mentors. But we need mentors who can do course correction, but not suggest technology. So we found it difficult to find these kind of mentors. But uh, we eventually found them and uh, from ISRO, uh, who are helping us to develop the kind of technology we want to do and say which is wrong, which is right. It took time because we wanted them with a dif uh, different mindset. It took time. It was difficult. And uh, now we are happy to say that uh, we have a couple of investors whom, who, on whom we are dependent so much to uh, do what we are doing. I saw a picture of you with uh, Deepika Padukone in uh, you know together and uh, uh, and there was a lot of news articles about how she is invested in uh, Bellatrix um, how can you convince a, a film star to invest in a space company in India first uh, I would like to thank our existing main investors who put in faith and um, of course uh, uh, having Deepika on board is also very exciting because uh, you know uh, she likes uh, to do something uh, new, explore, and I, th I think when we first met, uh, all thoughts which she had to be very honest was to support these young boys. So, um, and uh, that has been the interaction, and it's uh, fun working with her office, and um, her manager, Mr. Nitin, uh, is a very experienced person. So, uh, uh, it's nice to have her on board, I would say. But. Uh, any, anything more you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was uh, interesting because, uh, you know... Yeah, uh, because see, oh, one more thing which we had in mind is a um, uh, person like Deepika coming on board um, and, uh, you know, space becoming the hot topic. We also felt that uh, it would um, kind of uh, rekindle the interest of Indian investors looking on how they look at space. It is not a very... Uh, uh, a very only a tech-savvy investor can do. If he's with the right mindset, they can do. So it was a good message it was sent, is what we believed. Yeah, this is a particularly interesting because, uh, you know, people who have often wealth, who, who are, are normally outside of the space industry, Right, because people who have built companies or you know have uh, done other successful things and uh, have created wealth for themselves are often you know in other sectors, right? And convincing them to participate in the space industry is a big challenge. It is a big challenge. Uh, and slowly, I see some companies like you and you know Kava Space and few others have tried to convince some of these people and have been success yeah, and have been successful in uh, uh, in in doing so. Uh, so do you think this trend will continue where you will see more and more of these people investing? Uh, it will be a slow growth. You don't see an exponential rise, but I believe uh, uh, it will happen. More and more people will invest slowly. Uh, and uh, they should understand that the gestation period is larger than any other industry. But people are coming up and I think it will happen. And as you w know very well, space is a global industry. It is not limited to one region or anything. And there is uh, space is all about collaboration. One person can't do everywhere. So I think it's a very healthy uh, industry to work with. And in India, with the capacity which we have and with what ISRO has already done so far, uh, I think more companies will come in this field and uh, we'll have more such investments. It's especially interesting because uh, since India does not have a very strong VC scene for uh, space investments, uh, this becomes an alternative to having VCs because, you know, ultimately whoever is an Indian VC normally invests one to one or two million uh, dollars in a company, which uh, is the traditional kind of investment for a Series A or something like in in India, right? So I guess these uh, high net worth individuals in India can invest as much as a VC can normally do in India. Looking forward for the, the change to happen. Yeah. Uh, so in, in your current uh, role uh, as to how the you know, team and your uh, company is formed, uh, what about things like uh, having testing facilities for uh, you know, doing your tests uh, 
you know, what about you know qualification and so all these things that you have to have on the ground to to be able to finish the end product did you have to establish all by yourself or Yes, see, uh, if something wrong happens in space, you cannot send a service person to repair it. So space, uh, the quality which comes with some people just neglect it. Um, and some startups, uh, initially when they start, they don't think about quality. And uh, we were fortunate, our advisors first advised us to think about quality. And that's what we do. And we also realized that um, uh, the, the facilities which are required to test these things are not available anywhere and other than ISRO. So uh, we uh, kind of, that's why uh, our investment requirement was also on the higher side. So uh, we have invested in um, uh, facilities which are required to uh, fabricate, test and qualify these things uh, in-house. And um, uh, it took a lot of time to set these things up. And now we have complete uh, A to Z facilities to uh, test and uh, qualify uh, space propulsion systems. Space propulsion is very complicated to test, I would imagine, because uh, the kind of thrust level in space against the thrust level, you know, testing that on the ground, you, it's like moving a paper or something like that, right? Yeah, correct, correct. So, uh, what do you do? You use a thermovac chamber to then uh, you simulate... Uh, so you need very high levels of vacuum to test it, because if, the, uh, if there's no vacuum, the plasma which comes out uh, collides with the molecules which are present there, it lose momentum, you'll not get a good thrust reading. And uh, uh, you, in order to achieve higher vacuum, say for around uh, uh, 1 into 10 raised to minus 6 millibar, that level, and you have to pump the propellant. And still you need the pumps which are capable of removing all these gases and maintaining that vacuum. And if there is a drop in vacuum, your high voltage would you know, short and you'll have a passion discharge. There's a whole host of issues. So we learned, there was nobody to guide us. We learned it uh, through trial and error. And, um, uh, you know, setting these things was itself a nightmare. Of course, you know, in an area like propulsion, a lot of the equipment... And also to measure thrust is a very millinewton, micronewton thrust. Uh, uh, if you want to buy them, they themselves would cost in crores. So we had, you know, Indian way of doing some other little jugad way of uh, measuring thrust. So we have built um, our own calibration standards where we can test them. Yeah. So when you are dealing with uh, propulsion related uh, equipment and components uh, often you know these are all restricted components because a lot of these elements can be used for dual use, dual use. Uh, purposes as well um, so how accessible accessible is uh, you know all the equipment as well as the, the valves and you know sure. things like that uh, to you uh, while you are trying to, because I, I know that maybe not all of this is actually available in India locally to be sourced. So, uh, so when we started Bellatrix, we realized this would be a major problem. If there is one vendor, if some country put restriction, it would, uh, if it's a critical component, uh, it would be very difficult. So the way we structured Bellatrix is to be fully integrated company. So we just don't do thrusters, we do all its subsystems from power electronics to valves to tanks to everything. Um, uh, also, we have uh, our import margin is uh, very less, so we only rely on around 15% of imports. Everything is indigenous. And uh, one more good news is India is a signatory to MTCR, Missile Technology Control Regime. So after India became signatory to friendly countries, uh, US especially, uh, they have an uh, ECCN list, Export Control uh, Critical Component Numbering List, something, where they have a list of components which can't be exported to other countries. So since India became a signatory and with its, um, uh, what this government has done good is with uh, relations, so we now have access to those critical equipments from those lists. So uh, doing business has become easier in the past three years than, uh, in the last three years than what it was before. So what is the perception, because you are well known in India and you have been uh, working with Are ISRO <laughs> and everything. So, but then, you know, what is the perception of, uh, you know, potential customers from Europe or US? So we are looking to, uh, uh, the uh, ma main goal is to become a global company. As I said, space is global. So, for, uh, so that's why I said this year is critical for us. So we have to qualify the products which we are doing in space. In lab it is done. So post that we are talking to potential people uh, globally and um, uh, we are just waiting for our thrusters to be qualified and then, you know, uh, look at the global arena. So what do you think will be uh, the market for these propulsion devices on a yearly basis? And, uh, you know, what will be your ideal market share in that? Uh, it's a tricky question to answer because um, uh, 
unlike uh, uh, rocket pro rocket or small satellite launch vehicle segment propulsion you now that you uh, know recently faa has mandated that uh, every satellite have propulsion just not, not just for deorbiting but to do collision avoidance maneuvers so propulsion is becoming a mandatory thing in orbit so we see somewhere at least it would be great if bellatrix can capture at least 1% of the global propulsion market in the next 2 to 3 years so the quali the herit the space qualification that you want to do for example it will involve you testing just one thruster or multiple thrusters and what what is exactly the yes yeah. so looking at the technology readiness level uh, so by qualifying uh, space qualifying one thruster you reach tier level 7 so you want to reach 8 and above you need to have heritage the same thruster has to fly in couple of missions to prove it is there so right now we are aiming for tier level 7 and then uh, Eight and nine, goal. Eventually, yeah, eventually. Uh, so, apart from uh, ISRO, you talked about also the DRDO, and we've seen announcements of uh, you know potentially a defense space agency and defense research uh, agency and all these things. Uh, do you see any interest from uh, you know? Definitely, there is. Uh, we since we are also active and have couple of patents in the uh, in the field of greener propellants. So uh, that's one active area of research at Bellatrix, um, with support from IASC, of course. Uh, we are working very closely with them in developing futuristic grain propellants. There is also now a lot of uh, opening up into of the you know funding schemes for startups in government of India, and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the schemes that you know, especially in defense and others that they want to open up to companies. Uh, do you think companies like you will benefit out of this or is this the right timing? So not just us, uh, uh, other companies, which I see the uh, one thing which we faced initially when we started Bellatrix is we didn't have access to these funds. So companies coming now will not need, uh, will need, uh, do not need to face those problems. At the level of ideation itself they have access to these grants where they can prove it. So it's a good thing which is happening and many companies would benefit in fact. But they should also understand uh, what is the requirement of uh, be DRDO ISRO or globally. Um, uh, so, uh, some mistakes which entrepreneurs do is they think they know what the customer wants, but we have to see from the customer point of view and then propose. We are uh, here at the Kerala Space Park inaugural, and uh, you know we've seen the conclave happen for the last uh, day, and uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm in terms of uh, having uh, common facilities and you know. Uh, creating a foundation for many other entrepreneurs to start. Uh, so what do you think you know, a place like Kerala Space Park should invest in so that many other people can start doing more space? So first of all, I would like to thank the Kerala government for uh, having this good initiative and uh, br uh, making space uh, the main th in into the mainstream. And thanks to you for enabling it. Uh, it is, see, uh, majority of our funding went into capital. Right? So if there is a, a, a common facility which is very niche, so uh, you can put more money into developing the product which you want than into the facilities. So it is the right thing which they're doing. And I think um, um, uh, for, say, for example, if you want to qualify space electronics, uh, which had to be rad hard and with other level of testing, so common facilities will accelerate this kind of development. Yeah. And I think it's a step in the right direction. There's a lot of young people who want to work in uh, space propulsion and you know rockets and rockets things like that. particularly. I, I get emails almost on a weekly basis of people asking me, I want to become uh, the next Elon Musk or you know I want to do this and that. And for example, right. So, uh, what are the kind of skill sets that people need to acquire? Uh, because you know, of course, leadership and you know having technology leadership and executive leadership is a different track, but. A normal person who is trying to just become an engineer or a scientist with that kind of focus uh, to enter the propulsion arena, what would you suggest for people to work on? Propulsion or rockets in particular, uh, many people uh, even do approach me and ask what to do. So uh, uh, the problem is space is also this uh, very you know catchy subject that everybody wants to be Elon Musk or you know reach the stars. It's very it's fascination which captures their imagination. But that also leads to a problem. Uh, they do not know where they're headed. So before, if you seriously want to look into space entrepreneurship, I would suggest uh, spend some time understanding how the industry works. And now they have more opportunity because private people are there. And then take a call, maybe. 
and uh, because um, uh, it's not as easy as they think it is since uh, multiple things come but it is encouraging so what i would suggest is uh, th uh, it is better they know about it and then take and second thing most important they should have perseverance if they do it uh, perseverance to stay on until you deliver yeah and especially in areas like yours i guess uh, core expertise on you know chemicals and uh, chemistry building a team is critical as i said um, uh, bellatrix is not a man it's never been a one man show so we have a uh, range of expertise from uh, chemistry to catalysis to plasma physics uh, to combustion modeling cfd uh, to heat transfer so all these things structures so you need to build a team identify a team uh, which can stick on and uh, who are a, a core part of the team with these capabilities put together. It's a good, like how mom makes your good rasam, which tastes perfect. So that is required for a space company. You are very lucky to have a lot of good uh, advisors. Blessed, uh, in fact. Yeah. This is something that is actually very difficult for anyone to you know, uh, mimic, because uh, uh, getting uh, approached uh, you know, to uh, people who have had a lot of experience and have done uh, great things before is often very difficult in India and to access anybody uh, is, at ISRO at the leadership level is also quite often very difficult for young people. Uh, so what would be your advice on how somebody can you know, uh, get such an advisory team or people who can advise them in their journey? Yeah, I can only share my experience uh, because in our case, um, ISRO was supportive, is supportive. The only reason is we approached them after we had something to show. Case. Because, of course, uh, peop if you think in their, sh uh, stand in their shoes and think, uh, they would like to see because they know how difficult it is. So if somebody, I, be it software or uh, hardware or uh, if a company wants to do something, now since they have access to grants, uh, uh, from uh, let them qualify from ideation state to a prototype stage and then try approaching and I think this would uh, uh, cre uh, have a different impact than what... Um, uh, approaching them in the ideation stage itself. Uh, so, let's say, you know, uh, you see the ecosystem here in India spreading out. You have a propulsion company. There's a bunch of, uh, you know, satellite uh, manufacturing companies. There's a companies who are trying to do both satellite manufacturing and, you know, downstream services. Rocket companies coming up and all these things. Uh, so, do you feel that uh, at some point of time an Indian new space ecosystem will uh, have a self-sustained model where companies are kind of buying and selling between each other and you know doing uh, business in a way that is integrated through the Indian market. Correct. So that is a dream actually and uh, and I do hope it happens and it has to happen and um, uh, things are moving towards the east and um, uh, after moon opens up for commercial uh, commercial activities I think this will pick up momentum and I will see um, self-sustaining um, uh, uh, new space industry in India, and, uh, and we are being, and we are happy to be the first uh, ones in this game. And um, I think we can also continue to mentor who comes, and we look forward for that day when you know we are self-sustaining. You've solved a lot of pieces of puzzle over the years because you know money is one piece of puzzle, talent is another one, team building, advisory people, facilities. A lot of the puzzles are uh, solved. Uh, what do you think are pieces of puzzles that are yet to be solved? To be very honest with you, uh, nobody has understood the industry for what actually it is. So that's the biggest puzzle because you, it's not a predictive industry. Uh, so the, the demand, see it's a uh, low volume, high value market. So it's very difficult to understand. And uh, I would say it would take uh, two more years, uh, two or more years to you know, kind of uh, give a proper answer to your question. Yeah, and I guess also the biggest thing is uh, now we are at a stage where there's a flux of activity that has happened over the last few years. And now it's the cusp of people getting that kind of space heritage and proving themselves in, in space. True. People should also know what they want. And many uh, academic research is also coming into the market. Um, but where there is good need uh, has to be understood prior. So uh, uh, this, I think this learning is happening now. That's why I said two more years. The learning should complete, uh, you know. Yeah, I personally believe that it will be fascinating to see, you know, for example, you going and testing your s stuff in space at the end of this year, and maybe, you know, Pixel is trying to do that uh, 
in the middle of the year and in Kava space told me that you know they're also planning to fly things at the end of the year or early next year so if you know in a span of a year year and a half three or four companies uh, have really graduated to you know sending stuff up into orbit and testing it out i think that will create a serious impact not just in india but globally it'll create waves about indian companies maturing it will in fact uh, so it will show india in a very different light and i hope it happens because we have the talent required to do and we can do it a little differently and better is what we feel so one of the you know things that we see especially when talking to indian teams and teams abroad is uh, the perception of india and indian teams and so on so while talking to potential customers or uh, you know potential adopters of your solutions beyond india uh, you know in europe or us uh, do you see challenges uh, in terms of you know people saying okay we may not rely on an indian solution or do you think because of the brand of isro being very reliable you stand to benefit from this uh uh no in fact uh, as a matter of fact um, uh, uh gaining their trust is a very difficult uh, thing to do as of now so but uh, space being f- uh, for what it is if you are space qualified and uh, if you reach those tier levels they don't see you as an indian entity or this thing its quality is what matters best example is japan so deliver quality in space and um, i think everybody would accept you globally so my last question would be you know where do you see the ecosystem in 5 years down the line because uh, i've been asking this question around in this conference quite a lot because uh, it's interesting because when you started and we started it was hardly two or three companies trying to do things and from you know then 2013 or 14 to no, 2000 40 companies is what i heard today at the conclave yeah. so yeah. 40 plus companies now and mm. it's interesting that in 5 years that number has gone 10 times right i sincerely wish in 5 years this company sustain because looking at the global market companies come companies go uh, the fraction of companies which stay has been very uh, limited so um, i want to see this time 40 plus i would like to see them all sustain would be the first uh, thing which i envision in 5 years uh, second the investor community opening up in a big way and third uh, government actually involving private in core r&d uh, rather than just uh, uh, integration and testing so with that note uh, thank you very much for uh, you know coming on the show thank you for having me and pleasure